Um, I want to tell you why I support Tulsi Gabbard, but first I want to thank Tulsi for her service, as well as being Veterans Day, and uh, two tours in the Middle East, continuing service as a major in the Hawaii National Guard, and, um, and I want to thank you for your continued service, not just on the battlefield of war, but on the battlefield at Capitol Hill. <laughs> The attacks on your character, the smears, the uh, just from our most prominent political figures. You are truly fighting for us. And I can't thank you enough for that because it, it means so much to us that somebody is standing up for integrity, for true morality for this nation, for ethics, and, and others will shirk away from that. But you don't. You stand tall, you take those hits, and you're doing it for us. So thank you so much for all of your service to all of us.
forward at a time when truth can be hard to find. Uh, I want to say thanks to Richard for starting us off with the Pledge of Allegiance. Thanks to our many amazing volunteers here who have worked hard to make this happen. And thank you all. It is so good to see you. It's great to be back here in LA, and I'm so grateful you chose to spend a little time out of your Veterans Day here with all of us. And to kick us off, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask all of our veterans or family members of those who've served, if you can please stand and just let us recognize you. This is Ravaging our country, 
that veterans coming home with post-traumatic stress or chronic injuries that came from their service in combat. When they go to the VA, the VA is not allowed to prescribe them any other alternative like medicinal marijuana instead of the highly addictive opioids that are too often doled out like candy. But these politicians who don't want to do what is necessary to make sure that our generation of post 9-11 veterans do not fall victim to the same thing that Vietnam veterans faced with Agent Orange. How many of you here know about or were exposed to toxic burn pits while deployed at any point in the Middle East? All right, a few of you here. Toxic burn pits are the Agent Orange of our generation of veterans. We were deployed to a camp in Iraq about 40 miles north of Baghdad. It was a relatively large camp that housed people from all across all branches of service in the U.S. military as well as other service members from NATO allied countries. It was a very large camp. There was a massive burn pit where everything was burned. Everything, all forms of waste, everything you could possibly imagine, everything got dumped into that burn pit. We had soldiers from our unit and other units whose place of duty every single day was to go there and man that burn pit. Can you imagine the kinds of toxins that not, not only they were exposed to, but that basically created this ever-present cloud of crud, as we called it, over our camp. This is what we breathe every single day. As a result, we are seeing many of our brothers and sisters in uniform coming back, often having been exposed for year after year, deployment after deployment, with very rare uh, cancers, uh, respiratory illnesses, and other things that normally would not impact so many people of this age. Unfortunately, rather than actually say, yes, we recognize this combat-related illness, the VA, we will take care of you. No, they're asking for proof. Vietnam veterans fought for decades, decades, to get the care that they have earned through their service because of their exposure to Agent Orange, many dying of cancer before ever getting that care or getting that recognition. We are seeing the very same thing happen now with politicians saying, well, the VA says we need proof, so we've got to figure out how to get that proof. Another generation at risk of being left behind. These are the things that are so frustrating to us because we hear the words and people are saying thank you, but then we see these same politicians going and being the very same ones who will go and beat their war drums to send us on more unnecessary, wasteful wars. To go and wage more counterproductive regime change wars that have nothing to do with our interests in this country, that actually undermine our national security. And then once again, after doing so, when we come back, they are not there to take care of us. To me, Veterans Day is a reminder of what it means to honor those who serve. It's more than just us. It is taking action. It is taking action. There are many people who pay the price for war. I served in a field medical unit during that first deployment, where every single day my first task was to go through a list, name by name, of every single American service member that had been injured in the previous 24 hours. Go through that list name by name, recognizing that these weren't just names on a sheet of paper. This is my family. These are my brothers and sisters. And behind every one of those names are a husband or a wife, mom or dad, sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, anxiously awaiting their return concerned every single day for their safety and well-being, losing sleep at night, worried that they may one day get that knock on the door. I wondered then how many 
of our politicians. We're losing sleep at night thinking about them. Thinking about those who are paying the price for the consequences, the, the consequences of the decisions that they were making. My guess was not very many. Not very many. We came home from that deployment, leaving some of our brothers and sisters in uniform behind. Those who paid the ultimate price. Those whose families never got to say goodbye leaving that eternal emptiness in their absence. When we came home, we landed at Hickam Air Force Base. It was early in the morning. The sun was about to rise. Stepped off that plane, the air never smelled it so sweet in my life. But all of our families were there. Our families were there. They had made handwritten signs and saying, welcome home. Looking forward to this day, we had all been looking forward to this day. We stood in formation, there were a few hundred of us at least, listening to our commanding officer, finally giving that one last speech, waiting for the one word we'd all been anxious to hear, dismissed. At that point, the whole place went crazy. All of us just running back into the arms of our families, back into the arms of our loved ones. I went there, the first person I hugged was my dad. I had never, ever seen my dad shed a tear in my life until that moment. And as I gave him a hug, I felt his body, he was sobbing, and he was crying, just tears of relief. Until that moment, I really didn't realize the kind of stress and sacrifice and anxiety that our military family members, our loved ones at home, go through. You know, as we're deployed, we're focused on our mission, we're focused on getting that task completed. It's our families and loved ones who are left behind, holding down the fort, struggling and wondering and worrying for that day that we come home. These are the people who are paying the price for the decisions that politicians are making about where and when our men and women in uniform are sent into harm's way. Our veterans, our service members deserve to have leaders in Congress, deserve a commander-in-chief who is willing to make the kinds of sacrifices that our men and women in uniform make, who places that premium on putting service to the American people in our country above all else. <laughs> Leaders in Washington who are solely focused on putting the interests of the American people ahead of the military-industrial complex, ahead of the interests of foreign countries, ahead of partisan politics, to the interests of our people and our country and our freedoms and our principles enshrined in our Constitution above all else. We deserve a Commander-in-Chief who takes that oath of office seriously to support and defend our Constitution. And in doing so, actually reads it and understands what it says in Article 1 that provides Congress with the authority and responsibility to decide whether or not to declare war. It's unfortunate that we even have to bring these things up, but this is where we are, fortunately, in this country. Where this is the standard that we, the people, need to set for our leaders. That our leaders can look to the examples of so many great Americans who are literally living and breathing and embodying that principle of service. Look to their example for inspiration on how we can truly become a government of, by, and for the people. 
I'm running for president and offering to serve you to be that commander-in-chief. Bring those values to our White House. Those values and principles of integrity, honor, respect, and service to the presidency. Leading a nation of Americans who stand united on those principles enshrined in our Constitution. Respecting each other as fellow Americans. Even as we approach many challenges differently, as we have different ideas on how we can solve the problems that we are facing today, as we come from different political backgrounds or have different ideas, that no matter what, we respect each other as fellow Americans. That we feel that same sense of unity that those of us who've worn the uniform feel, whether at home or abroad, where we have people from all different backgrounds, different races, ethnicities, religions, orientations, people who represent the beautifully diverse fabric nation, wearing the uniform, focused as one unit on accomplishing that mission of service. How divided cannot stand. Our country is terribly divided at this time. There are many challenges that we face. If we have any hope of being able to move forward together towards that brighter future that promises peace and prosperity and justice and equality and opportunity, it requires us to stand united, to stand together as Americans, inspired by that love of country, that love and care for each other, that love and respect for our planet to be able to accomplish that. And by doing so, and by doing so, what we realize what could be more patriotic than fighting to make sure that every single one of our brothers and sisters in this country get the quality health care that we need when we need it. But when we do that, is what could be more patriotic than standing united to make sure every single person here has clean water to drink, clean air to breathe, a safe environment to live in, preserving and protecting the natural resources that we have. What could be more patriotic than standing up and fighting for reforms to our criminal justice system, to our immigration system, to our education system, making sure that at every single level in our government that policies are being passed that are keeping the well-being of our people at the forefront, getting rid of the corporate greed and the crony capitalism that has created such a poisonous impact on our lives. This is at the heart of the change that we know we need to bring about. And it's days like this on Veterans Day that serve as a great reminder of how we get that done. This is the question I get asked most often is, okay, that's fine, you know, everybody's got a lot of plans and got a lot of big ideas, but how will you actually get it done? We are living in a country that unfortunately is pitting one group of people against the other, that people spend so much time screaming at each other rather than listening, understanding, respecting each other. So this provides us with a guideway, the path on how we can do so going forward, respecting each other for who we really are, respecting each other as fellow Americans so that we can begin this dialogue, so that we can come together and work together to achieve what we know we can and what we know we must. Thank you all for being here today. I want to open it up for some questions.
Thank you.